Good evening. Um, tonight I'm going to be continuing on with the sketch cover we started last week. I got to finish it for my pal Jeff. I know he's waiting on this and a couple other ones. So we're going to try to get this thing to, at least close to done tonight. I don't know if we're going to finish it, but we'll, uh, we'll take it as far as it'll go. And um, yeah, I'll give you guys a little update on Undersea Hero. Um, I guess I'll do that first before we get too down in the weeds here. Um, I posted a picture of the last page that I had finished, which was this one. You see Crack is playing dice, and it ends on this panel. And then uh, the next page I finished was actually him throwing the dice. And I thought that this page, uh, in particular, um, the storytelling came out well. Um, as you can see, here's the prelim. The panels kind of cascade from the upper left down to the lower right. And the text interweaves and it explains how Krakus cheats at dice. And uh, it's because he uses the um, tiny little suction cups to manipulate the dice as he's throwing them a specific way. And then that way that they land on seven whenever he wants so he basically rigs it just by having you know the uh appendages of a, uh, a cuttlefish and the, the gumption so i'm doing those and i'm actually doing a replacement panel for an earlier page that i wasn't happy with the panel it was this one that we were working on um on the stream and what i wanted to do was create a more enclosed opening so this panel here will actually get replaced with this panel here um once it's finished but yeah i'll just cut it out paste it right up and then that'll be the the, the page um, the next page i started penciling is actually this page 16 where krakus is taking his winnings and i uh i changed the opening panel because to me between panel one and panel two there wasn't enough movement and it almost looks like no time passes where he grabs his chips and between these panels there has to be a beat um so what i did was is i made the top panel larger and occupying more space and thus taking up more time and you can see it's an over more of an overhead shot and there's going to be some chips flying up in the air and just a lot of movement and success and he had just won this game and then of course he gets approached by poseidon himself as you know the guy that owns the uh, casino and doesn't want to lose his money so he wants to keep crack his gambling and that's what he'll he'll try to do and they'll get into some mischief poseidon and Krakus at the undersea casino will get into some mischief so that is the Undersea Hero update currently. Um, hopefully I'll have that next page penciled in the next uh, two, three days, and then I'll ink it over the weekend and uh, we'll keep keep churning through pages. So project is still moving right along. Um, but I still have some of these things that I promised to help my friends with their Kickstarters. And this was the last Planet Comics Kickstarter. Let me get this mouse out of the way. It's not even plugged in. I don't know why I left it there. But, um, and in this case, um, for he people who weren't here last week, um, the prompt was space tick. So I wanted to have the tick and Arthur doing something only they would do. And in this case, the tick is kind of stealing this planet here and he's got the moon in his hand. So it's like kind of a little bit more of a uh, cerebral play on uh, proportion and size and then we've got these little guys in their little spaceships uh zapping the tick because he's stealing their planet and their moon and they're you know in danger so but that's where we're starting tonight um got my um kiritaki pocket pen here um that's what i, I do a lot of these sketch covers with because it's quick and 
gets the job done pretty well. Um, when I'm first getting started, I like to start on an area that is not as vital. Like I never start with inking the face, you know, or the the hands, or anything that is too too difficult. Because I want to try to get into a rhythm. I'm gonna start with like his little air tank over here. I have to slow myself down a little bit because my sketching lately has just been, had to be as fast as possible. So I just haven't had much time working on the book and doing doing regular work stuff. But some exciting stuff with the regular work stuff. I can't can't say anything because nothing's final. But some working on some cool projects. I didn't want to do like your traditional air suit because the tick is nigh invulnerable and it's a cartoon. And I always think that having a funny, cool visual um, in some sort of cartoon shorthand is far more entertaining than like a cool, like space accurate suit. Like that was never my preferred reading experience in comics. I, I liked silly things. Um, I didn't need it to be real in any stretch of the imagination. So I actually think I'm going to open a new pen. This tip is a little broken. And I think this is an old one. Yeah, we're going to open a new one. Brand spank a new pen. See, it's shiny even. Uh, let me grab my uh, circle template that is somewhere nearby. I just had the thing. Put it in this pile. Hmm. Well, that's a bit of a problem. Here it is. Here's the good old circle template. Just so that we get our moon spherical. I'll just draw one circle and then I'm going to freehand it after that. So I at least have a correct starting line. Um, I, again, I don't need it to be 100% correct. I just need it to be believable. These sketch covers that Jeff were pretty nice paper, I got to say. When uh, making up a phony moon, I just try to think of the impact craters, you know, as being where something crashed. So it looked like, you know, after a giant explosion had hit or something. You know, it's a big crater from something hitting the moon. So I try to picture what that would look like and how it would impact the, the overall design. And I don't want to render too much. Um, our light sources vary. Um, there's some coming from the blasters this way and the blasters this way and this way. I would say the darkest portion of the moon is going to be like right along the back here. And then there's going to be some shading underneath where his hand is. So that's kind of where we're thinking. So we do have a uh, like a rainstorm going on, so the internet may be a little wonky. I apologize. You know, if it gets too crazy, we'll just call it a night. But I just saw that it disconnected for a second, so sorry about that. I assume it's the weather and the fact that I can only afford like the cheap internet.
just picturing how, you know, things would wrap around a spherical shape in my head. And I'm making drawing decisions as I go. So my inking technique is actually just an extension of drawing. It's not actually like the inking in that traditional sense of where you're tracing over and adding just texture and, you know, line thickness. I'm still making drawing decisions. It's one of the reasons why, why I'm sure, you know, some of the old school inkers like my stuff, but like some of the more recent uh, inkers that I've met, they like tighter pencils to work from. So, um, just a different process of working. I remember I was talking with um, Jeff Isherwood, Isherwood at, at one show, I think it was in Vermont. And he was saying how much he enjoyed uh, the opportunities he got to uh, finish John Buscema layouts for like the old Savage sort of Conan stuff that he worked on. Because he would just give like the, the storytelling and the base proportions and stuff. And then there would be, you know, so much room for creative additions. Yeah. I just found that pretty interesting. I've done some inking of other people myself. I've inked Chris Campana uh, a couple of times on covers. Um, I've inked a few people, but by and large, I just ink myself. So I have only myself to blame. I can't blame the penciler because that's that's me. One fun trick that I can uh, pass along for any artist listening is, is if you're moving towards um, the light source with something like this, where there's a varied texture on it, one of the ways to spotlight the light source is just to make your texture a little more sparse as you get closer to the light source. And in this case, like I said, we're going to say it's here, here. Hey, Desiree, how are you? Thanks for popping in. I saw the replay of Otani's first at bat for the Dodgers. Very exciting. What's that like having a team that invests in the, the free agent market? I used to know what that was like. I bet. I bet it's makes the uh, makes the trip to the stadium all the more worthwhile and uh, Dodger dogs more plentiful. Yamamoto is going to be good. He is. It's going to be real good. My jealousy knows no bounds. But I'll, I'll mostly be watching uh, minor league baseball this season anyway. I kind of switched over to that a couple of years ago, and I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. All right. I've drawn a couple of things that to get our feet wet. Let's, uh, let's try working on one of the little spacecrafts. That could be fun. Don't worry. We'll get to the main characters. I just like to start off with some things that if I mess it up, it doesn't in my mind necessarily kill the piece. I have gotten a couple of invites to some conventions, so might be some Announcements to make might not. We'll, we'll find out. I do have that one day show in May in in, uh, in Fall River that I'm doing. It's pretty exciting. And then I'll be at the Little Giant show a few weeks later up in New Hampshire. Those are two that I can 
promote. I'll post the other. Uh, I, I was sent one of the posters the other day. I'll be sure to post that on social media. Yeah, he's holding the moon here, and he's holding a planet here. Um, and I was thinking about having a secondary title, do it in hand block lettering, like, hey, can we borrow your planet or something? Um, you know, because I, I, I happen to love when there's text on covers. You know, some people hate it. They just want the picture of the heroes as large as possible. the table sorry i like playing with those ideas and i think the tick is really good at pushing some of those uh just fun just playing with those concepts of space and size and proportion um, one of my favorite jokes from uh benita serino and les mclean's run is um there's a point where the tick is hurtling through space and um you know, obviously in space, you can't hear anything, but I, the, the joke was something along the lines of like, uh, he could hear the faint muffling of the word spoon careening through the, the cosmos or something to the, that effect, probably written far more eloquently or matter of factly. If Benito is around, sometimes he's popped in before. So um, we'll ask him if he remembers the line. It was a really good one. I think it was from uh, like the issue 100. People have picked up that one. I'm just gonna freehand the little bubbles because I, I like doing that. I have to get an even smaller pen to draw our little alien guy here. There we go. Just a little guy. Just wanted it to read as like a head with like an eye looking at the tick. I don't know. Let me just uh, try to make it silly. One of the things in Undersea Hero that I think that um, will do the printing and the coloring nicely is just making sure that I am uh, in the line art, differentiating textures as well as I can. And you'll probably see that with uh, some of my pages as it goes. I like the uh, the laser beams that aren't necessarily just the perfect little lines. So you'll see um, that for this, I just wanted some texture. You know, like if I gave this a, a color hold, it would be interesting to look at instead of just a straight line because straight lines can they're they're a really powerful tool in the arsenal and um they generally bring the eye directly to whatever has the straight line straight lines and uh, intersection points where two things overlap with one another those are two of your most precious and needing to be used with the most caution elements, at least in my work, that's how I see them. It's a little bit of a texture, nothing too crazy.
But yeah, and you need to be able to tell that they are coming from that plan out. So we need to show scale. So like this little guy is definitely in front of Arthur. So we have to have his little rocket trail ahead of Arthur. He's got another one coming from right here. And then we'll have the line get smaller and smaller. And we actually need it to go behind his antennae because that'll give us, again, it'll help us establish the scale that he's just this little tiny guy because of the way it's interacting with Arthur. Yes, it's the good air. Yep, yeah. you can't have the bad air. It has to be good air. And I'm sure there would be a very dumb joke um, if I ever got to write a tick in space situation um, that one of them would get, like Arthur would be like, get us two air packs and the tick would give him the one that's like bad air. It's a, and it says it on it and he would give himself the one that says good air. get started on tick here. I'm going to start with the hands because they generally take just as much concentration as a face because they have to have character and they have, you know, rules of proportionality. Hey, Chad, great to see you. Wednesday evening ritual. It is a, it is a pleasure to join you on your Wednesday evening. And here I am thinking, gee, do people want, still want me to keep showing up to these things? We do have our hundredth episode coming up. So we, I'm, you know, I've been trying to think of something fun to do other than just having, you know, my artist buddies on it. So if any, any regulars want to chime in with some ideas or if anybody has any fun ideas for what our, will be our hundredth episode. Hey, Dennis, good to see you. I will get to see you in person at that show in Fall River in May. Voice actor Dennis Dietrich. Yeah, like, do we, we have to draw something, but do we like have a beverage? Do we, I don't know. A toast? A drink and draw? Yeah, we could do that. We did do one drink and draw ages ago with my buddy Jay. Um, and it was the, like the, I think it was the first gen live stream, last one before COVID. And we were all like, there's this thing we've heard about. It might not be good. So we'll hang out. I haven't watched it since it was on. I don't like watching myself on anything. So but Jay said he rewatched it at some point and it was just like, it was weird. The Fall River Toy and Comic Palooza, that is the correct name. I apologize to the folks at the show if I've been saying the name wrong or I mean, no disrespect. A hundred, yeah, we're at, we're at 80, 86, my goodness. I have no way of knowing who's watched the most episodes. It's, uh, I, I, I got to assume Desiree's got to be like pretty high on that list, like having having hung out the most. I don't know. It's tough to say. Jonathan's been at a ton. Early on, my uncle was actually on like most of them, just hanging out in the background. I'm actually going to be probably doing the ice jump this weekend. Uh, 
Chad, I agree. Yeah, it's uh, and you do tons of interviews, so yeah, you must be over a hundred interviews. Hey, Matt, good to see you with your website and everything, your YouTube. And... Oh, good. We're all in the same boat with not wanting to see ourselves. Desiree says that she does the same as far as not wanting to watch her, her own interviews. It's like that one time we were all having spaghetti, like randomly, like everybody in the stream was having spaghetti for dinner or pasta of some kind. Tonight I had a hamburger with a, a side salad. I was going to have the headline be something like, can I borrow a planet? Like, kind of like uh, Milhouse's dad. Like, can I borrow a feeling? I think was his album cover when he recorded his own album. I think that was the name of it. Okay, see, with the foreshortening, this shoulder line needs to come up just a little bit. And then it's behind and then over here, this needs to come forward just a little bit. That's where that is. We have light coming from here. We have light coming from here. I think you get a little bit of a shadow from the planet, like right there. All right. Well, let's get a let's get our precision pen and see if we can get the ticks thoroughly warmed up, done a little bit of figure, gotten stuff. So I think now we can come in here and try to make this happen. There are some lines that I need to make where I have to move my hand faster, and there are some hands that I have to actually move it slower. So the different quality of lines, some of it is affected by the speed at which I move the pen. Um, and some of, my, some of my feathering is a pull line, and some of it's a push line. It really just depends what type I'm trying to do. Um, Quiet. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just being quiet because I'm just focusing a little bit because I don't want to mess it up. I know it's just a sketch cover for a Kickstarter, but I still always try to do my best on the pieces. Um, it's one of the reasons, like my commissions, if if I agree to do any, take me a while because I, I just don't. I'll redraw stuff. I don't want to rush things. You know, I'm, I'm pretty particular at this point. Um, I just want people to like this stuff. That is some great TNA. Very good, yes, very good. Over on YouTube from from Jean Blapier, Jean La, Jean Blapier. 
Referring to Tick and Arthur, yes. Excellent. I did get a message from NEC the other day, so I have no idea what their plans are for anything ever, but we'll see what they say. NEC actually, that was um, when I was talking about going back into doing Undersea Hero, I do remember at one point, and it wasn't just for Undersea Hero, I had asked them about publishing stuff other than the tick with them, because they had done it for years. They had done war comics, they had done all kinds of stuff, but they just didn't really have the bandwidth to publish anything outside of just their, what little tick stuff they were doing. Because they're still just a store, you know, most people don't realize that they're a retail store, not really like an independent publishing entity. Early on when I was drawing the tick, I did mess around with some different uh, angles and shapes and stuff, um, just because I was struggling to really comprehend the design um, as far as how it worked in a three-dimensional idea. So anybody who's read my tick stuff can absolutely um, see the evolution of how I drew uh, both characters. So who pubs for NEC? Uh, NEC publishes themselves. Um, they do. They still to this day. They have since uh, 1986. So they, they've been around since the black and white boom. Um, they were actually instrumental in early Mirage days when they hadn't gotten like the next big licensing gig, like the toys hadn't happened or whatever. And um, George um, bought up like anything that they had in the warehouse um, at one point. And that's why NEC always had like minty fresh copies of those early Mirage TMNT books for decades. You could go there and buy, you know, a TMNT 2 first print. I was just looking at a comic the other day and NEC used to put ads in the uh, Marvel comics. Um, you know, you can pull out stuff from like Secret Wars era, you know, that part of the 80s into the early 90s. And, um, you know, the tick would be listed in it as hot on their own ad. And um, you can see in those early ads that they had at that point, they had those TMNT issues in their warehouse. But yeah, they were able to give it mirage some much needed funding at that juncture and then you know the toys came out the show came out and the rest is history but there's a little blip in between the boom of the first comic book and the boom of the um licensing and all that stuff where nec has a little little footnote right there And trust me, for years, myself, uh, Jeff, and other creators tried to get a crossover going with Ninja Turtles, and it just, it never happened. Um, and even when, I won't, I can't name names, but even when people who would be instrumental in making it happen wanted to make it happen, they just couldn't, like with legal stuff or whatever um, at times. I'm certain that if, um, you know, Kevin and Peter still own the turtles, that um, a crossover at some point would have happened. Uh, 
Oh, I can hear Bruce. Is there a little? This is my planet now, chum. That's right. This is a very simple texture where if you're playing at home, um, if you have any sort of pen or brush pen where it gives you a little bit of flexibility, here's a brush just to exaggerate it. All, all this texture is is just parallel tapered lines like this. And that creates that, that look. I'm just using a slightly smaller uh, instrument. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it, you know, as it gets further away, you mush them a little closer together. And one of those wonderful little tricks is, is, is if you don't have the ability to make it all uniform, perfect, make it imperfect add texture move it around give it motion you know do something to throw it off because that almost precise never looks precise so move away from that has been kind of like one of my artistic mottos over the years There have been a lot of things at NEC that we tried over the years. There's different creators that we had talked to about doing covers and things that they'd agreed to, you know, or they were interested in. Like I had, I had big name creators that I, you know, had no, they had no interest in talking to me, but they were interested in the tick and, you know, they would ask me like, or they'd tell me like I would do a cover or whatever. And all I could do is like take a business card and pass it along. I'm just adding a little bit of a cross texture. And this is where, what I was talking about, those intersection points where it creates visual interest and draws the eye in when you have that sort of uh, break, break point. Perfect can be the enemy of good. Almost perfect is just like the worst. But that doesn't mean you're not making creative decisions and doing things thoughtfully. You are just making an account for what it's lacking. And I don't even think it's covering it up. Like you're just taking an intentional direction away from like, could I have taken out, you know, the bendy ruler and marked all the little lines out and had each arc done with, you know, the circle template and everything. I don't know. I just, I find that level of precision boring. You know, some of my favorite comics are like extraordinarily flawed from many different perspectives, but I just love them to death because there's such character, such life to it. You can see how much they care about what they're working on on every page. Love that. Absolutely love that. We've got this one arm coming up, but what I need to do actually, uh, in order to fit it, make sure everything fits together, is I need to draw the other little spaceships. And I know that's not the most exciting thing to watch me draw, but I think it's necessary for the piece.
because we have him getting shot here, and then we have another one coming from above, and then one, so, he, so he's surrounded. A photorealistic tick would be terrifying, I think, um, unless you were doing more of like the suit style of like maybe the, the second season of the Amazon uh, tick show, the suit to me was perfect. I never thought they necessarily got um, the Arthur suit down on that show. It, I mean, it was so fancy looking, so I, I get that it had a different intent. Um, but I, I still like the Arthur suit from the Fox TV show. For, I don't know. Oh, thank you, Michael. I'm glad you're enjoying it. It's a silly... It's a silly yarn, as it were. And it's definitely one of those where, I don't know, I think they paid for approximately one character and I'm just like, yeah, I'll just keep going. And that just happens. There are no tricks, you know. Someone was like, how do I trick Ian into drawing the entirety of Secret Wars in my sketchbook at the next show for Ten dollars. Gotta have like the little couch, classic couch back. It's Rick Moranis in one of those ships. <laughs> Lord Helmet. I mean, honestly, that's one of those movies that if it's on TV, I can watch it at any time. Here's our second little spaceship. Honey, I shrunk or space balls. How about both? How about we have like a tiny little. Like the little action figures that he's playing with in space balls. <laughs> what, is it, what does he say? I'm, I'm afraid of you, but I'm strangely attracted to you. These are a little further away, so what I wanted to do was, at least for the first little bit, have it look a little like the lines were kind of straight. And then we, as it gets further away, like they start to lose their structural integrity. So This part of the muscle, like it's really one of the things that I find myself making a mistake on is not having the pectoral muscle be three dimensional or it ends up being flat. So I have been trying to get, make sure that I add, you know, a little lip there. And then this is even above that. So, and there's a light source there. So we'll just add a little bit that shoulder muscle that comes over the top. The other thing I need to be mindful on this is, is, you know, the background is going to be largely black. So if we go in and we add any spotted shadows, we don't want to lose the integrity of the figure. And that's something that can happen. And there's sometimes you want to do that intentionally. Like if I want to push this arm further away and then I can even push this leg further away, losing part of the integrity like this, you see this where it's overlapping. And that's just going to disappear into the space. 
Like that'll just be gone because there'll be a black background. That's the optical illusion that occurs. I always uh, exaggerate the rib cage on tick. I'll give them extra, a few extra ribs just because they look, I think it looks funny. Like he's worked out so much. He's in such great shape that he has more bones, not just more muscle. That's funny to me. I don't know. Might be stupid, but. And the other leg, because like here's his hips, like there's the hips, and the leg comes this way, the socket's there. Junk. The leg actually comes back, so we have to have it coming from the right angle. There we go. And then the top comes, there's going to be some overlap there, because like where the skin and the muscle meet one another they're actually going to like smush a little bit so like the shape changes and there's a tension at that break point so what we want to do is have it come up and then we can have just a little bit of where that muscle is and that muscle is and then here because we have these two light sources and i wanted to have a drop shadow from where his arm is like that like this and I think based on where this light is that it would come across like here like this and then down again like that And if it doesn't look right, we always got white out. That's the beauty of working in just black and white. You can always just use the other color. Extra ribs from all that good air. Exactly, exactly. I'm glad we're all on the same page here. Well, that's, it's because if you look at some of the comic books from when I was a kid in the 90s, like the, the anatomy was just so bad. And like, because the tick is so of the 90s, what I like to do is like bring some of that exaggeration like with it. If you look at what I'm just drawing for myself, like for fun, the people I draw are nowhere nearly as exaggerated. So it's not like a, it is, it is very much a conscious choice. I want to do the same thing we did here where this is all going to disappear into the background, but right here and here, I'm going to make a choice. I want there to be some of the integrity we talked about, and I don't want to create a tangent. So I'm actually going to short it right here. I'm going to leave a gap here intentionally so that when we fill it in, it has a graphical choice there. Again, these are all just silly decisions that, you know, I continue to have to make as I'm doing the drawing. Like other artists, they, they don't, they make the decisions before they get to this point. Um, and maybe I would be served better with some of it by doing that. But I like being able to adjust on the fly. It makes the drawing process to me more exciting. I used to find the inking process so boring when it was just more of a tracing process. But once it became part of my drawing process and not just like dark feeling like I was just darkening the lines and like going over it again, um, I really became, it became my favorite part of the process. I mean, I think everybody likes 
the moment when the box of books shows up on your doorstep and you're just cracking them open after all the work's done. But like, as far as the actual work, um, this part that you're seeing right here tends to be either this or the initial concept, depending on the day. Some days I feel like my ideas are not so hot. So I'll, I'll something like this where I've already done the idea-ing is ideal for, for me. There's a little blaster. But now you can see all the little ships like uh, zapping at the tick. So makes more sense. And it, it is funny because like even people who know my work, who have seen a lot of it, um, they can't always tell what I'm drawing until it's more done than I would think. Um, you know, when I'm in the blue line prelim stage, I get it. You know, it's, it's tough to tell what's going on. But, you know, some people it takes to like when the pencils are done or when the inks are in process to know what the heck I'm doing. Got to put a little like scowl on him, a little frowny face as he's defending his planet. And then we've got our little uh, rocket trail. I love drawing this sort of thing, little rocket trails. It's just a fun organic shape. Goes like that. Again, if I were coloring it, I'd probably put a color hold on, you know, the outlines of the guys ships but yeah now that i have this here i know where i need to put the break i know where i can come down and add the heavy shadow so that that's there i actually think that we're going to need to put a break there You know, when you're drawing with a little pen, you know, instead of a brush, you're using form, drawing with line. You have to build up some of the space, some of the 3D spaces. So that takes a little extra, extra work, extra time. I find painting uh, actually, like with watercolors or whatever, to be a little bit easier because of that, because you're working and blocking out big shapes instead of having to define shape and texture and lighting and everything with just a collection of blobs and lines. Sometimes when I do really uh, gestural um, ink brush drawings, I get that feeling. But in comic books, that's such a rare thing to be able to do. At some point I'll do a piece, like a sequential narrative in that form. I gave some uh, some comics to some of my coworkers. I think they think I'm a little crazy, but they told me that their significant others were were comic book fans. So I wanted to give them some free comic books. And I think, I think Desiree and I have talked about this at a show is that there are so many people that um, don't know that the tick was a comic book first. Like they just know it from the TV show or the video game or the cartoon, like the cartoon from the nineties, I, I think is most people's entry point to the tick. You know, and I've said as much at, uh, to NEC and they, you know, have mixed feelings about that, obviously, just because they started the comic book. 
it was so great. It was so weird and wonderful. And it had like a, it had a weird pontificating lesson being read by Townsend at the end of every episode. I had hoped to ask Townsend to do a, a, a read for under row, um, just read a page or two out loud. I agree. There's nothing wrong. Anytime you can discover it is, is a good time. Um, but you can understand there were, you know, there were changes made of the cartoon from the original comic. And I would say that especially Bob Polio, the art director is very much like, uh, sees the original comics as like the only point but even ben has said the creator of the tick that like the tv shows and the cartoon and everything were just part of the character's evolution and especially the last tv show is you know um very much how he would have taken the character it's just in another medium because he was the showrunner on that. So when you have the original creator as the showrunner, how can you argue? Hey, Isaiah. Never a bad iteration of the blue guy. I'd have to think about that. Maybe the pogs. Did people like, did people really like the pogs? I don't know. We were at New York Comic Con once and, um, the manager of what was once the new Bedford store Palmer and I were doing the show together and um, he had found a giant bag. Isaiah says, um, personally, though, I'm partial to the cartoon as it was my intro. Yeah, I, I, it's tough to beat that, that first meeting of a character. You know, I've said it many times, like my first uh, meeting of the, uh, the Marvel characters in that Marvel holiday special from 1991, I was spoiled. I had, you know, Walt Simonson, Thor, I had Art Adams drawing Fantastic Four. You know, it was just such a great intro for me. Um, and all kinds of uh, big time creators on that book. It's like they called in every favor. Um, I am going to put some things in front of uh, the Planet Comics logo and some things are going to be behind it. Like the Tick's hand is actually going to have to come in front because um, otherwise we're going to lose our, um, our perspective. Actually, it might have to go behind. Like part of that antennae might have to go behind now that I'm thinking about it because the hand is behind the logo and if the head's in front of the logo, it's going to be like the hands crossing up. So... We're actually going to have to keep everything behind the logo. I just realized that. So. That's what we shall do. Let's get our brush going a little bit. We've got a little more room to move now. On these smaller pieces, like this is just eight and a half by 11. So it's tough to use a ton of brush just because I need room to move my hand. And also on a sketch cover, I have the thickness of the book itself, which makes it tough. A little bit there. And the reason I didn't put a big shadow on the underside of the arm, I thought about doing it that way was because of this drop shadow that you're going to see here. And it is split by those two laser blasts. And then 
make sure that drops back a little bit in front of the foot. And because he's actually standing on an asteroid, we can put another shadow down here that helps actually centralize and point towards Arthur. Like there's, we need him, you know, it's framed and things pointing towards different parts because you're trying to get people to look all around the piece. So direct creating directional devices. Don't have to be too worried about the line thickness on the outside of the uh, asteroids just because we're going to be uh, filling it in. You know, I'm thinking I'm going to take out the captions. I'm just going to have it stand on its own. I think that that would be a nice, weird way to have this thing go. Here, I'll show you where that arm disappears into. And then when we fill this in, it creates that spatial movement. And then when we have, you can see it comes back and then down. And then we'll have this side filled in too. So once it's all filled in, it'll really, it'll pop and it'll pull the figure forward. If I'm talking too much, you can just let me know. I can just uh, go back to doodling. I have to freehand this part because it is uh, bigger. The helmet is just slightly bigger than the largest circle on my template. So we're going to flip this around so that I can do a more steady pull line. Now, when I'm having to freehand a circle, what I like to do is do half of it or part of it going one way and then the other part going the other way and have it meet in the center. Because I find my accuracy is better that way. building up that line a little bit. And what we can do is take our circle template, come back, put, drop it here, and then do kind of do the inner ring of the glass and put that in place. And it'll help sure up visually the line behind it. It'll make it look more straight than it is. There we go. Classic bubble helmets. I think they're required. I think that by law they're required for your, your cliche space comic. Did I see cliche? I meant vintage classic. Never out of style. No. Just on all kinds of cool stuff. There's actually in Planet Comics number one and in some of the others, there's some great essays in there talking about creators. So he does some really interesting stuff and hires really good artists who aren't me. Let's see if we can clean this up a little bit. And pull some of this. Now we get to find out really how good the paper is because the first test is not necessarily in just laying it down, the ink down, but whether or not a light eraser pulls all the ink off. There was once a sketch cover, I think it was from Dynamite that I had to work on for somebody at a show. It was, it was Dynamite and it was an evil, evil Ernie sketch cover. It's probably the worst sketch cover I ever had to draw on. Cause I had, I drew it, I inked it, and then I tried to erase and I ended up basically erasing the whole piece. All the ink kept getting coming off. So I ended up redrawing like the whole thing, which that was a drag. So having to draw stuff twice at a convention is not, not 
not ideal. That was at a show because I would never have bought it if I had been handed that paper. And I see some places where we're going to have to spot some shadows. We're going to have to drop some ink in there. But I like to get some of the structure down and then clean it up some so I can get a better look at it. I have not had hardly any personal time at all as far as like being able to just read or whatever. I have done some sorting so because I can do that when I'm basically falling asleep. Just sorting some of my collection. So I'm trying to, after the move, get, get the boxes in order so that when I'm looking for a comic or whatever, I know where it is. It is satisfying though when you get like every issue of a run put together or like all the ones that you have and you can have them all in one place. It's nice. Big giant hands. The tick has big giant hands. I, I the, the version of the tick that I just would have just been fascinated to see was a Jack Kirby tick. It never happened. Kirby drew the Ninja Turtles and he drew some other stuff, you know, um, late in life around the time when the tick was around. Um, but him being on the West Coast and NEC obviously being on the East Coast, they did not cross paths. But you can see how my line structure comes together. Once, once you start to clean up all those random little pencil marks that I make, it starts to make sense. Like, wow, we had a plan from the beginning. Mostly, but I still have to make decisions on the way there. I'll add a little bit of spatter for where the little bas uh, blasters are going. Just go in with my slightly finer pen and I can add some of that texture. We got one more little spaceman to draw. We'll, we'll take care of that. We'll finish the good air tank. But, you know, I don't know how much longer we're going to stay on, but. Yeah, like I see one right here where I'll just grab my brush. And this is the beauty of using a brush instead of a pen is that I can look right here. This is going to be space so I can prime the tip and I can just go like that. And then there's that one little break that I needed right there. Uh, we're probably going to need to pull this over. Add a little bit of shadow here and there on the hand, but not too much because if you put it all the way to the edge, you lose your, your shape when you fill in the background. Um, honestly, I would have liked to have painted this one, but um, I definitely have already gone over budget, as it were. I'll draw a little guy here, this little frowny face and angry looking eyes. See his little couch. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. Glad I was able to help some.
what becomes of this? This was a Kickstarter reward for um, a uh, for Planet Comics. So a backer uh, went on there, and I had volunteered to do commissions to help fund the project. And this was just a, a blind commission where they just gave me a topic of space tick. And rather than just drawing, anytime I get the tick or somebody that I'm familiar with, I like to make up a little story. So you definitely get more for your more bang for your buck when I kind of lose it. There were like five or six other ones that I'm uh, not that many. I think four, I think I have to do four other ones. And, you know, it's simple stuff like pretty lady in space, um, pretty lady on moon. Um, and then I think there was one that was artist choice. In which case I'll probably draw like one of the old planet comics characters. Like the Martian detective. I'm waiting for my WC cover. WC cover. Oh, watercolor. Gotcha. Gotcha. For Undersea Hero, was that that one? Did you get one of the watercolor covers for Undersea Hero? Ah, yes. Yeah. Those will go out when the book comes out. The, um, the projected delivery for everything, um, as it says, is for end of the summer. So that's when... Uh, that's what I'm working towards finishing the book for. And so, you know, as you can see, I, if you wanted to catch the, uh, the update, I did do the uh, update for the book at the beginning of the stream. You can just rewind back um, and I could went over the pages that I'm currently working on. But yeah. Any plans for San Diego Comic-Con this summer? I don't know yet. There have been discussions. I do have um, a pro badge if I want one, but uh, it's just a matter of the cost and everything. Everything that goes along with going to San Diego, as I'm sure, I'm sure you know. Um, I'd like to go. Um, my buddy, Nate Lovett, uh, is going to be there for the first time, and I'd like to be there to show him around. Um, But yeah, are you going to be there? Nine seventeen. All right. Let me grab my straight edge. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I've been lucky to be able to go a handful of times, so it's not something that I take for granted. That's uh, not something that I kind of went into last year thinking it would be the last time I was there, just because, you know, NEC hadn't put anything out in a while, and I had to pay for everything, and it was a expensive venture that I would not necessarily do again, like every, be able to do every year. So Desiree will be there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I made the special edition of undersea hero for last year's uh, San Diego. It was a, it was a big production.
Ah, yes, there we go. Okay. See, sometimes I need little reminders. I, I, I forget. I, it was, I think it was the, uh, I can't see the, the picture of your profile and Jean Blapierre seems like a, a nom de plume to me. So. You never know with those prelims, you know. You, I, I collect them from other artists, but there are times where it's like uh, maybe it, maybe it's maybe it's too crazy. Ah, okay. okay. Twenty nineteen. That was, um, I think, that was the year where I was like catty corner from David Lloyd. I think he was like across the way. There was one year where he was just sitting there by himself most of the time. Oh, wonderful! Well, thank you. Um, and it was just crazy. He was just doing. That's he. He has the situation that I would love to get to with with conventions where I can just show up with like a box of crayons and a handful of paper and uh, just hang out and draw for people and not have to worry about the the commerce and the commodification of everything. I would love to someday be in the financial place to do that. Pre-done art and stuff, they, um, you know, that stuff would be be for sale, I suppose. But I would just like to just sit there and, and, and draw and just have a sign that says basically, like, I draw things. <laughs> Well, it's 920. I think we've made some pretty good progress. I think, um, you know, I think we'll call it a night for this evening. I'll go and relax for an hour before I got to go to bed. And thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming in tonight. And um, yeah, I'll finish this probably tomorrow and uh, post a picture of it. And hopefully, I see you all next week. Everybody has a hope everybody has a lovely weekend and thank you, thank you, thank you for spending your Wednesday with me. Good night, everybody. <laughs>